All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maggie Ray, and I will be uh, co-hosting today. Uh, just thank you for joining us for this program, uh, Southern Illinois Spring ID Walk and Talk. During the program, please stay muted the whole time and do not share any video. If you have a question about um, a plant being discussed, then please feel free to put those questions in the chat box and we'll be answering those questions as we go. If you have any technical questions or problems with your viewing of the program, please refer those to the chat box as well, or you can email me and that information is at the top of the chat box if you just scroll up. Um, also, please do not try to describe a plant in the chat box for identification. If you um, if you could email a picture of that plant to me, then I will send it to our presenters and they will email you with the ID of that plant and any questions you may have about it next week. As usual, this program will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel at a later date. I will send you out an email with that information for our page um, after today's program. So we have two presenters. We have Aaron Garrett. Erin is a University of Illinois Extension Energy and Environmental Stewardship Educator. She covers Union, Johnson, Alexander, Pulaski, and Massac counties. And then we have Austin Little. Austin is a University of Illinois Extension Horticulture Educator. He covers Jackson, Franklin, Williamson, Randolph, and Perry counties. Uh, with that, I will let Erin and Austin take it away. Thanks, Maggie. And uh, thanks for joining us today for the Southern Illinois Spring ID Walk and Talk. So uh, the, this kind of approach to this program today, this is kind of a pilot program. So this is the first time we've uh, presented something quite like this. And so we're going to go through each of these slides, uh, each of these submissions. And I or Aaron will kind of address any uh, general questions about this plant. And if there really isn't a general question, we'll just kind of talk about some basic care and uh, a, few, uh, a few pieces of information about these submissions. So uh, we'll go through each one of these. And at the end of answering the general question about this plant, we'll have, we'll, we'll have uh, some time for each one of these slides if there are any specific questions for that plant and then we'll move on to the next one and at the end we'll we'll have a general uh, Q&A so we're scheduled till uh, 2 30 for this program so we should have plenty of time I think we have about uh, I think about 30 submissions here and so I am going to cover kind of more of the uh, what you'd call common landscape kind of plant materials uh, sh flowering shrubs, trees, these kind of things, and some perennial uh, flowering plants. And Aaron is going to talk about kind of more of the woodland or kind of uh, native kind of plants. So uh, that's those are the things that Aaron's going to focus on. So let's go ahead and get started here with our first slide. Okay. So right off the bat here, we've got a, an azalea, really bright, kind of vibrant pink azalea, and these are still in bloom right now. And azalea is uh, related to rhododendron. So the scientific name, the genus is actually rhododendron. And uh, there's um, a lot of different varieties of, of color in rhododendrons. This one is a, one of the more common kind of bright, almost neon pink uh, varieties, one of my favorites. And so the question here, best suggestions on uh, caring for azaleas, and let's talk about pruning. So the question was, when is the best time to prune our azaleas? So the best time to trim an azalea is, the, the, the best window to do that in is gonna be uh, close to after the blossoms have faded. Uh, but before new new blossom buds, uh, new blossom buds rather, have have uh, started to uh, bloom or develop. So the idea here, and this is going to be the same for uh, a lot of flowering perennial shrubs. So we want to do uh, the majority of our of our pruning. You can do shape. You can do small trimming and kind of shaping things. Uh, in the spring or, or fall. The idea here though is that after it blooms, uh, right after it blooms, that's when it's going to go into its phase of, of developing new tissue and uh, new branches, new buds. 
So if we wait and, and we trim after that new growth is developed, we're trimming off the buds for next year. So, so on this new growth, that is where our flowering buds are developing this year that are going to bloom next spring. Uh, and that's the same for viburnums and uh, lots of other uh, uh, flowering shrubs. So that'll be a common theme for pruning uh, practices for these uh, kind of perennial. Well, this is, this is actually a, a broadleaf evergreen. So this uh, keeps most of its leaves over winter. And so these new buds on the azalea are gonna be starting in about, uh, to develop in June or July. So we need to be pruning before that. Another thing to keep in mind is with azaleas, they, they grow, their, their form is more natural and they're not really well suited to heavy pruning like we would do with maybe some evergreen, some broadleaf evergreens like boxwood um, or, or other kind of uh, needled evergreens that we might trim more like arbor vitae or, or, a, or a yew or something like that. This, this plant uh, really, it's gonna do best if it's allowed to have kind of its natural um, sort of uh, branching and um, a little bit more of a asymmetrical kind of, uh, kind of branching out. So that is pretty much what I have for azaleas. And if, okay, so are there any other questions from, uh, from the chat, Maggie, for azaleas? Um, I don't have any right now. I don't know if we want to wait just a second to see if anyone has a question. Sure. Um, but I don't and, have any at the moment. And if somebody thinks of something, we can we can add that to the uh, just general question and answer. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move forward. And this next one is for me as well. So this is a magnolia from Ducoin, and um, I believe. This is a Japanese or the common variety is a Jane Magnolia. And these are a really common uh, ornamental landscape tree that we find in Illinois and in definitely in Southern Illinois. In Southern Illinois, we actually start to have the uh, evergreen magnolias, which are really an interesting tree that we don't have further north. So it's kind of a, a, a cool uh, variety of magnolias that we that we get in Southern Illinois. But this is the uh, a deciduous um, species. And it's gonna be one of the earliest blooming uh, ornamental trees in spring. It, it even starts to bloom in late summer, or late winter. And uh, yeah, this, so this one is a Japanese or Jane Magnolia, but there's also a saucer, white star. Uh, and um, some of these are, they can be in kind of a, uh, a, a large uh, shrub form or even a small tree. So they're kind of intermediary there as far as size goes. And let's see, so other, um, other ornamental trees for the home landscape that stay relatively small in size. So I have a few examples here, just a, a, a handful of smaller ornamental trees that I, I think are some of my favorites are dogwood, uh, and uh, Cusa dogwood or the Cornus florida is the is the native uh, species in Illinois, Cornus florida. But there's lots of cultivars and varieties of dogwood that do pretty well, and they they have a a, a low kind of branching uh, uh, structure and uh, form. So they're they're a really nice, uh, cool landscape plant. Add, add some interest and interesting uh, growth pattern. Uh, red bud is another one that uh, stays relatively small, can get up to 20, 25 feet maybe. Uh, again, uh, early blooming in the spring, so when we're seeing the bright purple uh, early blooming trees, those are probably red buds, among others, but red, red bud is a very common one. Service berry is a large shrub to small tree, and uh, probably the larger one on the end of this would be crab apple, but uh, it maybe gets 30 feet by 30 feet somewhere in there. So uh, at the most, uh, you can get uh, smaller uh, yeah. dwarf apples. And uh, uh, so there's a range of sizes for those, but those are what I would recommend. So we'll, oh, and uh, any questions? Let's uh, see if there's any questions for. Um, yes, one. we do have a few questions. Um, 
hold on just one second. Okay. So uh, the questions we have are, and these were, I think they were both for um, the Magnolia. Are there any varieties that are less susceptible to scale was one of them. I don't know right offhand. I'd have to, that's something I can look into. And if, um, if whoever has that question wants to email me, I can look into that. I don't know right offhand, but uh, most of these the cultivars are going to be, uh, are going to be bred for uh, resistance to common diseases. So that's what breeding programs really are good at is uh, selecting traits that are uh, resistant to common diseases and, and, um, issues with, uh, with the health of the tree, kind of uh, better vigor, these kind of things. Scale, a lot of times, is um, something that happens in conjunction with other uh, pests. So uh, ants are usually in, associated with, uh, with scale, so they kind of happen simultaneously. And so sometimes uh, what you're trying to control isn't necessarily the tree, it's, there's something else in the environment, like, like, uh, ant, there's, you, you have an ant, uh, overpopulation and they're, uh, promoting or, or encouraging scale growth. And then, uh, scale growth also causes other kind of things like, uh, um, uh, sooty, uh, or, uh, um, kind of a, a dark, uh, mildew on leaves from the honeydew that they produce. So, um, as far as, uh, uh, scale resistant. I'll, I'll have to look at a specific variety. So yeah, if they if they uh, want to give me their info, I can get back to them on that. Okay. And then, are there any cultivars that can handle um, zone five? Yes, uh, I would say White Star. Just off the top of my head, White Star and Saucer Magnolia are going to be hardy enough for uh, the far, farther north zone five. And there's probably some other. There's, there's lots of cultivars, but uh, the two big ones that pop out to me are uh, the uh, White Star, Magnolia, and Saucer. Just the, the, those are two of the most common. Okay. I think that's the only questions we have right now for that. Okay. And we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so this was a weed question here, and... So we've got this undesirable, um, these saplings that are growing up into this rose bush. So this is something that's really common. And it seems like it happens a lot with roses too, where we have these uh, pest kind of plants that are pretty smart in a way because they're, they're established, trying to protect themselves by establishing themselves in a, in a desirable plant so that we can't quite get to them. Um, and we, uh, we had talked about this and this species, uh, were, were kind of on the fence between there being, the, they being maple saplings, so something in the Acer genus, or it could be sweet gum. So the question that we had was, do they know if they have, uh, ornamental maples or, or a sweet gum, uh, tree nearby? So if they're in the chat and they, and they could answer that, then maybe we could, narrow it down. Other than that, though, uh, as far as the control, like what to do about this is going to be the same. Um, so, so trying to uh, excavate these are going to be tricky because we risk damaging the, uh, the roots of the, uh, of the rows. So uh, we want to be careful if we're going in there and trying to dig these out. And, and these have pretty extensive tap roots, whether it's maple or uh, the, uh, the sweet gum. And so if we leave any of that taproot in there, it's going to uh, re, uh, redevelop and uh, uh, it's going to uh, uh, regrow. And so that's probably not going to work. So what my suggestion with this, and I, I, I try to, you know, I try to encourage people to use less pesticide, but with this, if you, if you have some, some nice sharp uh, uh, hand pruners, I would just cut it down uh, is about you know half an inch to the ground, and uh, with and we're talking about precision application here of brushing on some herbicide on the open uh, cut that you make. So what that's and, and it needs to be done right when you make that cut, and just brushing on a small amount of herbicide like Roundup, and so that will 
uh, that will cause that that tissue to to uh, um, transport that into the into the root system. So so we're only uh, treating the the uh, the pest plant in there. So we're not affecting the roots of the um, the rose. But again, we want to be really careful so that we don't uh, uh, expose any of the desirable plant to that pesticide. So precision, like with a small paintbrush, is really what we're talking about. Okay. Any questions on this one or comments? Um, I don't have any right okay. now in the chat box. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Okay, so here we have hostas and hostas are a really great plant for shade. They, they're, they're one of these plants that uh, they have a attractive foliage, a ton of variety and color and variegation. And they also have uh, some nice uh, flowers that, that uh, bloom on, on stalks in the early summer. And those are typically like lavender or white or blue. And so the hostas in our front yard are relatively large and we're considering dividing them and planting some in the backyard. What is the best way to do this? And when is the best time to do this? Okay, so splitting hostas is best done in spring or early fall. And ideally, uh, uh, the gardener should plan on dividing hostas before, um, before it gets really wet. If you can try to in the fall, before we, we kind of have, I guess, a, a vague form of rainy season. So if you can do it before it starts to get too cold and wet in the fall, that's, that's good. So sometime in late September, early October. It seems like in late October, we start to get more kind of rainy, colder weather. And hostas suffer most when uh, they lose large amounts of their roots. So digging as much of the root ball as possible, um, like for example, let me get a pointer. So we could split this one into twos probably, uh, even threes and uh, into thirds. Oops. This one um, could be split up into maybe four parts, or this one too. Uh, you know, the, the, the tool that we're gonna need is a very sharp spade uh, for this. You wanna make sure that you have a very sharp implement that's clean so that you don't uh, introduce the roots to any kind of uh, uh, un, unwanted uh, uh, microbes or anything like that. But a, a nice sharp spade is, is what's gonna work best for splitting these up. So we just make sharp, clean cuts without with doing minimal damage to the roots and transplanting as soon as possible. And if we're just doing a few divisions, if we just wanna get a couple starters, it's better to uh, take from the sides, from uh, plantlets that are kind of forming uh, um, new, uh, uh, a, a new, um, uh, plantlets off of basically the mother plant. So these kind of spread out by, uh, by uh, uh, budding off. And um, so if we kind of take a, take a part from kind of the, the younger, newer part of the plant, that might be the way to go. So one other practice for, uh, for uh, propagating or splitting up hostas is called the, the Ross propagation method. And so in spring, you would take a, a sharp uh, scalpel or a, a small knife and uh, make a, uh, an incision on the white basal plate, which is uh, just, just above the roots, so right above the, the crown of roots. And so what this does is it encourages a callus formation and uh, a new plant to bud off from there that we can then come back, maybe even early as fall, if it's, if it's established enough and grown enough, we can, we can remove that and transplant that. Uh, and we want to do that when they're showing good color and vigor. So you might be able to do this Ross propagation method in the spring and then come back in the fall, or maybe you might be waiting till next spring to go ahead and, and make those divisions. Okay. Any questions for this one? Um, yes. And we do actually have a question um, from the last slide that came in. Um, it, when you were talking about applying Roundup with a paintbrush, they were wondering, is that still a diluted um, form of Roundup or is it yeah. just the straight Roundup? <laughs> oh, no, no, you definitely need, if a, a public service announcement, if you're, if you're looking at using Roundup, uh, make sure that you read the uh, 
all of the informational labels, make sure you're wearing uh, all of the recommended uh, personal protective equipment. And no, you'd never want to be using un, uh, undiluted or uh, uh, pure Roundup. That's going to be very dangerous, uh, toxic uh, material. And it needs to be, you need to look at the rate. So whatever rate is recommended on that, whatever product for uh, say a small woody kind of weed, uh, that's the rate you're going to want to use for this application. Okay. Um, for hostas, um, do hostas benefit from dividing or do you do it just to make more in other areas? Uh, both. I mean, overall, eventually, yeah, eventually they're going to start to get crowded. And especially if you have a mix of different hostas in a bed and they're going to start to overcrowd other, other things in the garden close to them. So uh, for long-term health, yes, they, they, it's kind of a re, uh, revigorating and, and uh, revitalizes them uh, so that they can kind of start to um, uh, kind of uh, re, uh, uh, regrow. So they do benefit from that. But it's also, uh, yeah, they, uh, they also, uh, it's just a, a way to create more hostas in your garden and uh, kind of multiply your, your, your hosta um, installation. So, so the, both of those, yeah, they, they, they do benefit from that every couple years, about every three years, you might think about splitting them up. Okay. Um, this one is a specific question about like a specific variety called praying hands hosta. Um, it's five years old and they're saying every year it shrinks. It only had two nubs pop up this spring. It's in a shaded mulched bed behind a garage with four or five other types of hostas and all the rest are doing fine. Um, are there any thoughts on that? Was it praying hands? Yeah, uh, you can look in the I, chat box. Yeah, I, I have not heard of that specific variety, but if it's, if it's not uh, regenerating and not uh, spreading, then I wonder if it's some kind of environmental issue. Um, if some hostas actually do need a little bit of uh, part sun, and there's even varieties that that prefer more sun, so I wonder if maybe it's one of those that needs a little bit more light than part shade. But um, other than that, uh, maybe it could be that uh, there's a nutrient deficiency or there's something that, if it's not spreading, then I would think there's something in the environment that's limiting the growth. But I, I. You know, it's hard to say what that could be, and that would be one again where um, if they wanted to send me a message, um, I could uh, try to get more info and maybe we could figure out why it would be uh, not, you know, uh, not uh, uh, regenerate, well, not spreading more, not being kind of more active. So, but uh, as far as the specific variety being, you know, something about it, I, I, I would have to look into the the variety there. So crane hands. I'm, I'll make a note on that one. Okay. Um, in the next question, um, are talking about the division. Um, is the division recommendation true for every, for even the large, the very large hostas? Um, they have a very large mature one and I cannot pronounce that name. If you want to look in the chat box real fast. Um, and they don't want to mess uh, mess it up too much. Cybel D Dina Alignus Aling I can't say it. Sorry. <laughs> Cybel Diana Elegant. Um, Elegant. Yeah. I and there's so many varieties. I I'm not very familiar with all of the different varieties, but uh, for a larger, older um, pasta, if it's healthy, you know. And it's not uh, over, and it's not. It doesn't seem like it's suffering or anything, or or have any issues. Then, you know, I mean, if you don't really need to split it up, I would say if it started to seem like, you know, it maybe was uh, overcrowding itself, or kind of growing beyond its its uh, resources there that it has, then then it, then it would be okay to split it up. Um, Splitting up an older hostas, overall, generally, I'm going to say that that would be a beneficial uh, thing to do for the plant to help it regenerate and start start new uh, forming a, a new uh, um, uh, individual plants. 
So uh, if you wanted to, but then again, if it's, if it's healthy, if it seems like it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have any major issues, then, then uh, it, I don't think it necessarily has to be done for, for that, you know, that specific uh, variety. Okay. Um, and we did have um, the person who asked about the, the praying hands hosta um, just kind of add something in there that um, had twisted folded leaves. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to look at that. Maybe that'll make more sense to what you said. If not, we can just, um, I'll send my information. But other than that, yeah, that was I, the last question. I'll have to look that one up. I Yeah, and uh, like, twisted leaves sometimes are part of its normal, you know, uh, it's normal morphology kind of it's it's sort of its natural form so i don't i don't know uh, twisted leaves could be uh, uh could be could mean a lot of things. so so this this is something that we'll we'll have to uh uh if they could email me well i can give okay. them some more info on that okay so we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide here Okay, this one is from Johnson County in Vienna, and this is Euonymus fortunii, also known as winter creeper, so that, or Euonymus, it's also called. And this is a shrub that I've gotten a few questions on ID before because it's kind of this indistinct sort of um, plain looking kind of evergreen shrub, and it looks like it could be a lot of things, but this is winter creeper, and it's probably some form of of uh, gold or or some kind of uh, variegated golden form. So it's a ornamental, probably commercially, originally commercially bought shrub, and we can kind of see some of this uh, variegation here. And maybe in in more light, it gets more variegation. But uh, this is a uh, kind of a broadleaf evergreen shrub. Uh, doesn't really have conspicuous flowers, uh, small white flowers, but it's more grown for the foliage and it's evergreen. So that's really all of the info I have for this one. Um, it's a, you know, it's kind of a filler kind of shrub. It can be used for like a, a green screen or kind of privacy screening, these kind of things. Um, are there any questions for this one? If not, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I don't have any. Okay. And this is another one from Johnson County. So half of the branches do not have new growth. Should these be cut back and what time is best? Okay, and this is a uh, Wigilia. Uh, Wigilia, Florida, uh, the variety is Bramwell. It's kind of got this copper uh, purplish hue to the leaves. And uh, so this Wigilia, again, with these kind of uh, uh, spring flowering shrubs, the best time to prune and cut uh, cut back any material. So those dead parts that aren't really flowering, those can be cut off or, or pruned off now. Uh, they're not really doing anything beneficial for the, for the plant. But for uh, heavier pruning of the vegetated parts and, and uh, the parts that we kind of are still, you know, are still healthy, yeah, we want to wait till right after it flowers. And that's going to be the best time to uh, prune this wigilia. I think for time's sake, Let's see, we're, so we're at 1.30. So uh, are there any questions for this one? No. Okay. No questions. And here we have lilac. And so the question, our lilac was pruned very aggressively last spring. After this was done, all stems were cut down. So they cut it down to about three feet at the base, and at least a third of the cuts were made. Do not have okay so uh, some of it didn't grow back which uh, if you're if you were cutting down uh, cutting the whole plant back um, if lilac bushes uh, become unsightly or overgrown and uh, you decide to prune the entire bush back um, down to you know a couple feet or a foot off the ground sometimes that's necessary to try to revitalize uh, the the lilac, but keeping in mind that you may have to wait uh, up to three years for new blooms to develop because it's kind of restarting, it's kind of pressing the restart button. And 
Um, the best time to prune lilacs, same, same as uh, for Wigilia and, um, and, and uh, Azalea, same thing. Wait till after they, they bloom in the early summer. And so other than that, pruning out, uh, kind of pruning out uh, dead branches, this kind of thing, cleaning up any debris, any kind of uh, um, debris around the plant is going to help to reduce uh, disease pressure, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, any kind of major shaping, pruning, that should be done after flowering. So as far as uh, the parts that didn't come back, I mean, you know, uh, that can happen when you trim uh, a shrub back all the way, it's going to kind of shock some parts of it. And, and so I uh, might have some parts that uh, basically, you know, uh, shut down. But uh, I would just remove as much of that dead tissue if it's not regrowing, just kind of remove it down to down to close to the ground. Okay. Okay. Um, should you fertilize or provide anything to the lilac after a hard pruning? Sure. Yeah, you could apply something like a like a slow release fertilizer, but. You know, with these kind of flowering, unless you, if you, if you don't, if you haven't done a soil test and you don't really know exactly what the nutrient levels are, I would recommend uh, something like a, like a all purpose, slow release kind of fertilizer or even compost, something that's going to slowly, um, uh, slowly integrate into the soil over time instead of a, 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 a big hit of uh, a fertilizer. And uh, I would only do that, you know, in the early summer, because if we're waiting till later in the summer, what we can run into is an abundance of, we can, we can force the plant into producing a bunch of young, tender vegetative tissue that doesn't have enough time to harden off in the winter. So uh, I, the best time to do that is going to be spring. Um, uh, either, you know, and, and if it's a slow release, this is something we can apply uh, in the spring after, after last frost. And um, yeah, up to the time that we prune it is also going to be a fine time to go ahead and apply some kind of, I, I, would, I would recommend a slow release form of fertilizer. So whether that's some kind of uh, coated fertilizer that releases over time and uh, something like a 10-10-10 like a would be okay. I wouldn't necessarily use anything more than a 10% nitrogen, whatever, whatever it is, I, I, I look at something like a complete uh, uh, fertilizer, but probably not anything with a ton of like high, high nitrogen that's going to possibly uh, overstress the, the plant. Okay. All right. That's all we've got for that one. All right. What do we have next here? Okay, so this was this is one that Aaron I think is going to talk about. So I'll hand it over to yes. Aaron for this one. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. I didn't realize there wasn't <laughs> pictures for me for quite a while in this. Um, so yeah, we got this um, red stemmed plant that's popping up in this flower bed. And um, I actually did ask just this morning for a few extra pictures of this one, and they just came in during lunch. Um, so we can't tell from the pictures on the screen here, but I do believe this is a smart weed of some kind. Um, and it's got this um, sheathing part of the plant right where the leaf joins the stem with hairs on it that I couldn't see from these pictures but I got a close-up picture. Um, so it looks like a smart weed. There's a whole bunch of different species of smart weeds. Um, they're native but they're you know, true to their name. They're pretty weedy, not really desirable. Um, so I recommend pulling them because um, they're not really going to be a good um, addition to your to your landscape bed. Um, Austin, I'm not sure if you had any other recommendations for preventing them from um, establishing, but that's kind of what uh, I have. The only, the only other suggestion I would have is um, mulch. So mulch is just a really good general way to, to keep weed pressure down. So usually what I recommend for mulching in an ornamental bed is uh, starting off with trying to remove as much as you can or hoe in as much of the uh, existing weed material as you can and then uh, apply a layer of newspaper or even cardboard and then uh, three about three inches of uh, nice uh, hardwood mulch uh, and uh, 
you know, or you, you know, it depends if it's, if, uh, if, if the plants are, uh, you know, let's just recommend hardwood mulch for now. There is uh, cedar mulch and these kind of things, but some plants don't do as well with uh, pine mulches. So we'll just recommend hardwood mulch. Uh, that's going to be okay for most plants, about three inches. And I usually say, you know, untreated, but it's up to, it's up to the, uh, the gardener. So that's the only other control tip I would give. Great. Thanks, Austin. All right. Should we move on? Yep. Uh, yeah, I don't have any <laughs> questions. Okay, we will move on. And this is another one for Aaron, I think, right? Oh yes, this plant. <laughs> so um, this one, they were looking for an ID um, for this woody plant. Um, in the middle of the picture, there's kind of a lot going on. Um, and Austin and I went back and forth on this one for a while. Um, so we went through a couple things that looked kind of like a trumpet creeper. It looked kind of like a hickory. But what we think we're settling on is it looks like a wisteria. And um, wisterias are typically planted in um, the home garden. But um, down in southern Illinois, some of them have escaped. Um, and are uh, moving through the area um, in some of our natural areas. So it wouldn't be surprising um, that we'd see one of these crop up. Um, it doesn't look like this is in a lawn. It's maybe um, along um, near a roadside ditch or in the back of their property. Um, but we can tell it has a woody stem, but it looks really vine-like on the top. So um, if anyone had any other suggestions, we are happy to entertain those. But what we're gonna, uh, conclude at this point from the picture that we have is that it looks like a wisteria. So um, unless you wanted it in your garden, I would say um, to pull it just so that you're not um, continuing the spread of this one. All right, and we don't have any questions. Okay, yeah, and I'm Pretty convinced that this is wisteria and it's what convinced me was this kind of vining part of the of the um, branching and foliage here but uh, yeah wisteria can become a, an extremely invasive and hard to get rid of uh, problem okay this one is from Union and Alexander County, and this is uh, a very common uh, weed, spring uh, perennial cool season weed, and it's in the mint family. So this is commonly, the common name is Creeping Charlie or Ground Ivy, and um, it's, uh, so it spreads through stolons, and, it, and it, prefer, it, it does well in shady conditions, shady uh, wet conditions. So control is, you can get some effective control by hand pulling in small patches. Um, but, um, you know, as far as uh, kind of trying to eradicate it, it is difficult because any of these kind of things that spread by stolons are um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, pernicious. So, so they're pretty tenacious and hard to completely remove. Um, I, when I was uh, working on a landscape job, we had a guy that uh, wanted us to pull all of the uh, Creeping Charlie out of his uh, lawn and replace it with uh, um, Violet. And, uh, and so we, I think we did pretty well. It was uh, a lot of pulling and they kind of pull up in long strands. Uh, and, uh, and then we just tried to uh, replant with Violet in the same kind of conditions and it did pretty well. The violet was able to get some competition over, over the, uh, uh, the creeping Charlie. So that's, that's this one. Any, any questions about this one? Um, none right now. Okay. We'll go ahead and move to the next slide here. And I think this one is mine. And so I, uh, this is Daisy Fleabane and its scientific name is, Erigeron strigosus, and it's a native aster, so it's uh, registered as a native Illinois wildflower, but it's one of the more aggressive wildflowers, so it kind of falls into that same 
category is something like uh, bed straw. You know, bed straw is a native plant, but it does have kind of these weedy kind of uh, characteristics to it, where maybe we don't want this in our, in our planned spaces, in our gardens. Uh, however, because it's part of the kind of natural plant, uh, you know, um, kind of natural plant ecosystem, it does attract pollinators. So it's an aster, it's attractive to, uh, we see some uh, little critters on there, I'm not sure, I guess those are pollinators of some kind. But uh, so it's still attractive to pollinators. We have it on the green roof. And so this really comes down to uh, how we define weeds. Um, is it in a place that we want it or is it in a place where we don't? So that's really what the definition here comes down to. So on the green roof, it's a weed because it has very, uh, it has very extensive and um, fibrous root structures that we don't uh, necessarily want on the green roof. So these, we pull them up, they, they really do have a, a pretty robust uh, root structure. So that is fleabane. They also, Austin, um, they're usually visited by um, small bees and flies, some of those earliest pollinators that come out in the spring. Um, I know we have some in our yard and we leave it, but that's also our preference because my entire front lawn is pretty much violets in the spring. And we love it because we love seeing all of those um, small bees that have emerged and they're all um, buzzing around doing their thing. So again, personal preference, but yeah, if it started to take over my whole lawn, then I might take an issue with it. But <laughs> a few stems here and there. Um, you know, again, personal preference. I'm fine with it, so I leave them. All right. Well, there you go. So, so uh, there's some points towards uh, some some beneficial parts of uh, uh, flea bed. So it's got Aaron's vote. I'm okay with it too. It's just, yeah, it's and it is kind of a pretty spring flower. It's got like a whitish, even a lot of times it's even purple or pink. Uh, the okay. uh, the rays. So yeah, I uh, I. I uh, I, I hate to have to take it off the roof, but yeah, it's just kind of uh, right plant, right place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I also had something to add, maybe more of a nuisance thing. I keep it in my yard. Just There's just a few, but there's a lot more this year because down the road, a person didn't mow their lawn. I don't know if the house was for sale or what happened, but the whole yard was daisy flea bane. So it's all over our neighborhood this year, which it's not so bad, and they're mowing their lawn this year, more regularly so it's not I mean it was the whole yard it, it was very pretty I discussed that with uh, Aaron earlier but <laughs> it was a little more um it's coming up in everything now so I don't know it is pretty though but um I oh I do have a few questions uh hold on is it Are there any, is there any effective way, I'm guessing they're asking if it's if like, um, oh, this is for Creeping Charlie, actually, sorry. Um, so sorry, no, no more Daisy Fleabane going back one slide. Um, they are, it seem like they have a large patch of it, so they're wondering if there's any effective way to get um, rid of it on a, with a chemical. Um, it's spreading from the neighbor's yard and growing into their woods, um, among other um, undesirable plants. That are uh, okay, well, you're looking at chemical control. Really, you're talking about like a broad, uh, broad spectrum post-emergent herbicide. So, yeah, uh, it's it's uh, or you could try to if it's in patches, you can always try to spot treat it. But uh, so there's the post-emergent kind of thing, or you could try if you're if you're fertilizing your lawn, you could try a weed and feed. Uh, and so that's going to have a, uh, so those weed and feed products have a pre-emergent herbicide uh, that will suppress uh, 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 seed germination. So it's going to stop seeds from germinating. And that will help you with some of it. But I think with, with a lot of these kind of uh, weeds that spread by stolen, you know, it's going to come down to physical pulling and then if we're trying to do some kind of chemical application. So, yep, I mean, spot treating, if, if you're, if you're going to do like trying to remove all of it with chemical, then you're going to kill any, everything else <laughs> in that, uh, in that area. 
Uh, one other thing, if, you, if you're thinking about trying to just restart a whole area that, that you want to try to get control over is you could consider solarizing it with uh, black plastic. So uh, that's where you would just uh, lay down black plastic and make sure that it's, it's sealed on, on all the sides. Uh, you want to wet it down first and uh, wet, wet down the, the uh, vegetation first and then apply this plastic, but this is a long-term process. So depending on how much light and how hot it gets, it can take, uh, uh, it can take up to uh, six, six weeks. Uh, actually, uh, clear plastic is, is gonna give you a better effect than black plastic. So clear plastic will heat up a lot faster and get hotter. And then that, that'll basically kill off all the vegetation and kill most of the seedlings that are right on the surface uh, and give you kind of a clean slate to where you can reseed with any kind of uh, grasses or turf that you might want there instead, okay? All right, and um, I don't have any more questions. All right, we'll move to the next slide here. We seem to have some, some uh, interesting red lines here. I'm not able to use an eraser. I don't have the eraser option, so... Um, Maybe we'll just have to live with that, I guess. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, Jackson County Murfreesboro here, and this is uh, tulip poplar. Uh, also, the scientific name is uh, Liriodendron tulipifera. So this blooms between May and June, and it's a native flowering tree to Southern Illinois. And that's pretty much what I have for this one. It's a, it's a really nice, uh, pretty native plant, very common in Southern Illinois. Well, it's a nice native tree. Okay. As a fun fact, it's not a poplar. So right. a lot of people down here call it a tulip tree. Um, and these ones, I think they're, it's very easy to identify them if you're out hiking um, in the woods because their trunks grow extremely straight. Um, so often if you're out hiking um, in the southern Illinois area and you see just a tree with a very, very, very straight trunk, it's often a tulip tree. Um, and because they have those big yellow blooms, they are insect pollinated, um, which is different for a tree. And um, they also act as a host plant for caterpillars, for tiger swallowtails, and promethea moths. So that's just some other fun facts on tulip tree. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I, I, it's, um, it's always interesting to learn more about each of these species. Are there any uh, questions? I don't have any other questions for that. All right, we'll move to the next one here. And this is another one for me. And this is yellow wood sorrel. Um, the genus is Oxalis. And this is another native, but uh, seen as a problematic weed in the garden. So yellow wood sorrel is uh, best controlled by hand weeding and mulching. Those are going to, and I guess uh, the spot treatment with some kind of herbicide. But if, if the ground's uh, wet, you know, th these are pretty easy to pull up and uh, to, to take out. If the, if the soil is kind of dry, it's probably going to be a bit more difficult and the root is going to break off in the soil. So um, that is uh, yellow wood sorrel. That's uh, pretty much what I have. And uh, yeah, common, uh, common uh, kind of warm season uh, uh, perennial weed. Okay, uh, no questions. All right. Okay, this is Columbine and this is in Jackson County. Columbine uh, is a really nice uh, plant, perennial plant for shade. There are some native varieties. I'm not sure if this one is the native variety, but they, they do really well in shade. So this is an option for a shadier area. And they, they do well if they have something to climb on. So if they have some kind of uh, structure to climb up on, they can, they can really kind of uh, have, a, have a, um, a nice visual look that way. And so they reseed. So these seed pods here will dry up in late summer and drop, they'll either drop seed to reproduce that way, or we can collect seed and uh, propagate them. We can start them early indoors if we'd like. And um, are there any questions or any other comments about uh, 
We did have a comment about um, at saying, did we know that they are edible? I, think I they're don't different. know. The yeah. oxalis? I don't know if we're talking about which plant we were talking about. If it's the wood sor the yellow wood sorrel, yes, the okay. um, leaves can be to some extent. I'm not going to recommend you eat anything, um, but because these plants do contain oxalic acid, so that partially gives that bitter taste. Um, but I've known people that have put it in salads. But again, especially if it's in a home landscape, I with fertilizer and chemicals that have been applied there, I would not recommend eating that. Yeah, and they so. did come back and say, no, yeah, the wood sorrel, not the yeah, <laughs> not the columbine. <laughs> um, but yeah, no questions for the columbine. Okay. Yeah, and I had, I had heard that oxalis, you know, does have some edible properties, but parts of it are toxic. So it's one of those to be careful with. And um, columbine, I've never heard if that one was edible. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend trying it. <laughs> All right, and I believe this one is for Erin. Yes, okay, so this, um, this purple flowered plant um, was found in a field in a ditch, and it looks like a dwarf larkspur, um, which is in the buttercup family. And if he's growing there, he's really out of place and very resilient, because they're usually found in higher quality areas. So um, it's possible it's a, you know, a cultivar that escaped from someone's garden. That's highly possible. Um, but really great plant for pollinators. Um, lots of long-tongued bees, um, bee flies, swallowtail butterflies. They'll all come and visit this guy. So um, I was happy to see this one because he's a good native plant to have. Um, and he's definitely growing in a location I would not expect. <laughs> But yeah, that's all I have for Larkspur. Okay, um, no questions. Okay, thank you, Erin. That was a tough one. I had, I'm, I'm happy Erin's here because I, I was not really sure on that one. This is another one that was kind of a head scratcher for us. And yes. <laughs> so we were kind of on debating if it was a, a species of dock which kind of looks like this. It's got kind of these same, like long, broad kind of leaves, kind of same form, but uh, things about it don't quite seem like it's a dock. And because it's got these deeply kind of serrated leaves, that doesn't quite seem like a dock. So the closest I think that we're gonna offer is some species of wild lettuce. And so the, there's a native form of wild lettuce called the uh, Lactica canadensis, but it doesn't look like that one. There's a non-native, which the species is Virosa, and it looks a bit more like that one, um, but I, I'm not sure. This, is, this one was a, a, a tough one, but uh, it, if it is that wild lettuce, it's a biennial, and it should have a kind of a, a, kind of a uh, large fleshy taproot like a kind of like a, a dandelion, uh, for, uh, for instance. So if you have uh, a, 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 a like a weeding knife or, or like a nice uh, a garden trowel, it shouldn't be too difficult to pop that out. Um, if you're if you're wanting to remove it, it, it shouldn't be too difficult to pull out, I don't think. But that's really all I've got for this one. Or if you're really curious like me, because when I can't figure out what a plant is, it drives me crazy. Um, I would wait and watch it. Um, as long as you don't have a bunch of them, you know, all over your yard. Um, if you do, then, and you don't want them, then pull them all out, but leave one and I'd wait for it to flower. Um, and then that's gonna really help with that identification. Um, and then if it turns out to be something you don't want, you could easily just cut off and remove that flowering head um, and then dig it out. But that's my recommendation because I always want to know what these plants end up being. So I'd want to watch it and, and get another clue um, to help me to key it out and figure out what it is. Yeah, good point, Erin. And, and that would be if, if we're really trying to figure this one out. Yeah, let it go to flower. I, it doesn't look like it's 
something that would be too toxic, like a giant hogweed or something like that. Uh, those and it, it, those kind of tend to have a different foliage. So um, yeah, maybe just kind of see what happens with that one and let us know. Maybe send us a follow-up picture. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll move on. Uh, no questions. Okay, this next one is a really interesting one that I think Aaron will talk about. Yes, this plant, um, you're probably not gonna believe it when I tell you the name, but the common name is the Obi-Wan Kenobi plant. And I'm not kidding. Um, so it was named by someone who really enjoys Star Wars. Um, but it is just a tiny um, summer annual. Um, and it used to just be restricted to the southern, um, like, uh, fifth of the state, but apparently it's spread more throughout Illinois um, since my version of my <laughs> flora. Um, but it just has these, um, you know, deeply um, lobed leaves that you can see here. If you can't tell, there are some little flowers on there that are white. Um, they're five-parted flowers, but um, it's an annual, so um, it's not going to come back year after year. It doesn't look like it produces a lot of flowers, um, and I don't think it's that common, so I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But of course, if you don't want it to spread, then um, you can go ahead and pull it. But it is native. It has a really cool name. <laughs> that one was fun to research. Uh, okay, and we don't have any questions. <laughs> All right, yeah, this, this is a neat one. And I had no idea about the Obi-Wan Kenobi plant. I wonder what it was called before the Obi-Wan Kenobi plant. Must have had some name before Star Wars, but that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it was just described relatively recently. Oh, okay. Um, and that's why, but yeah, I wonder cool. if that guy has named other plants. <laughs> The, uh, the Luke Skywalker plant, gotta look out yeah. for that one. Okay. Okay, and this is a plant that has been around this uh, property for, in this landscape for a few decades. And so this is a leather leaf viburnum. And they get to about 10 feet tall, 10 feet uh, spread. And the typical bloom time, they have uh, nice kind of white uh, clumps of flowers from May to June, creamy white flowers, and uh, full sun to part shade, and a, and a nice low maintenance uh, uh, ornamental shrub, and very common in the landscape. And I, I've got a slide here next that's uh, one of these same species from uh, a hedge in my backyard. So why don't we jump over to that, because it is the same thing here, just another example of, uh, and this is with the flowers. So this is another leather leaf by burn. Okay. Are there any questions for this? Uh, uh, no questions at the moment. All right. Then we will move on to the next one. And this is another Aaron slide here. And this, uh, this is in my neighborhood. I took this yesterday. I thought this is a good specimen of this plant. Yeah, so this is a red buckeye, um, and it typically is grown as a small tree or a shrub, um, and it typically ranges between about 6 to 25 feet tall, and um, pretty easy to identify, especially with those flowers, so it produces those really large clusters um, that are typically about 10 inches long um, of those red flowers. And um, those will then develop into nut-like fruits that are a couple inches in size. And when it doesn't have those flowers, you can easily identify it because it has palmately compound leaves. Um, so there aren't too many um, trees and shrubs with that arrangement of leaves. So that should help you identify it pretty quickly. Um, it is native and rare in the wild in southern Illinois, although it is commonly planted um, in the landscape. And it is pollinated by hummingbirds. So if you're looking to attract them to your property, this could be a good choice for you to um, add into your landscape. Okay, thank, thank you, Erin. And yeah, mentioning the, the popularity of this as a landscape plant, I think that about 80% of the 
gardens and landscapes in my neighborhood have one of have, have at least one of these, and it's and it's very common in the landscaping on uh, the campus at SIU. Maybe because it's red, and I don't know. You need very a white plant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on here. So this one, this one is from SIU campus. Oh, we did have a question. Okay. Um, actually, the, the question about the, the red buckeye was answered as um, you kept going, but we did have a question about the viburnum in the previous uh, slide, if you knew what kind it was. Um, I mean, it's the, the, the broad variety is the uh, leather leaf viburnum. All right, and that's all we had. Okay. Okay, this is from the SIUC uh, Ag Building campus. And this has kind of been a shade garden. And uh, I, at first I thought this was a lilac, but it's definitely the flowers are not lilac. And uh, I'm fairly certain that this is some kind of abelia uh, and possibly an abelia grandiflora based off of the kind of uh, pinkish flower color. So the flowers, uh, they look exactly like abelia to me, and that's what I am going to uh, go ahead and uh, go with for this. And uh, let's see, the the abelia is uh, a uh, spring blooming, another spring blooming perennial shrub. Gets uh, can get up to six feet. This one is pretty much uh, mature and and at about six feet. So uh, this one might even benefit after flowering, of course, from doing some pruning. So it's kind of, but it, this is in kind of a wild kind of woodland shade garden. So maybe this kind of more naturalized wild look is nice. And it really is kind of pretty with these nice cascading uh, falls of, uh, of these nice pink flowers. So very pretty attractive shrub and uh, low maintenance. So uh, can do shade. Uh, can uh, can do uh, um, kind of a shadier kind of woodland conditions would be a good environment for this plant. And a lot of these plants, they don't really require extremely fertile soil either. Um, lower nutrient soil can be can actually be better for a lot of these kind of flowering uh, shrubs, spring flowering shrubs. Any questions about this one? Uh, no questions. Okay. Then let's see what our what we have next. Okay, so this is from the SIUC Green Roof, and this is a wildflower that I think Erin, are you able to speak on this one? Yes, I am. This okay. one is foxglove beard tongue. The scientific name is Penstemon digitalis, and it's a really beautiful spring to early summer blooming native prairie plant. Um, it's a uh, perennial and it has opposite leaves and then those really striking um, tubular flowers um, which kind of limit what pollinators are able to visit it. So it's visited by uh, mostly long-tongued bees, so like bumblebees, that are able to access those flowers. Um, it's beautiful to include in your home landscape. I have one in my yard and um, it's the first of my native plants to bloom, so it always makes me happy when I see it flowering. So I highly recommend this one. Um, and yeah, it's just a really pretty sunny, it needs full sun prairie plant. That's all I hey, got. Thank you, Erin. So, <laughs> okay. and, and I've, I've been wondering for years uh, as I work on the roof what that was. So that's really great to have an ID for it. And it's, it's one of the more common plants on the roof. I think that we see it back there in the corner there. As far as the uh, kind of the more flowering things, there's a lot of sedum up there, but uh, that, and this, this is an interesting sedum here that's in bloom. There's some of that up there, but uh, we have Coreopsis and a few other natives, but uh, that one is quite common, along with Fleabane, which we, which we kind of battle against on the roof. So thank you for that. And any questions about this one? Uh, no questions. Oh, wait, one more. Hold on. Uh, could you repeat the name of the plant? Yes, it's foxglove beard tongue. So if you get up close and personal with this flower, there's like a bristly um, 
tongue-like structure <laughs> that's um, in the center. And um, that's where it gets the name, a bearded tongue. So I'm forgetting my botanical um, flower part names right now. So, <laughs> but it's really cool if you can look inside and see it. Um, very aptly named flower. I think that's a good description. That's a pretty scientific description. We'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. And that is uh, no more. We don't have any other questions. Okay. Moving, moving forward here. And this is in Jackson County. So uh, a couple of years, well, years ago when I was walking around in, in the neighborhood I live in now, there was one of these trees and I was just like, I had never really seen anything like it. And it, and it was the same time of year. And it just had this amazing uh, bouquet of, of a tropical almost, like I would describe the scent of this as like almost vanilla. It's very sweet, uh, very uh, distinct. And uh, so this is a princess tree or uh, polonia. And it's, it's, I think it's a beautiful tree. However, it's, it's one of our really problematic uh, non-native invasive species in Southern Illinois. So it's got very invasive qualities, um, unfortunately. Uh, so this uh, grows and produces uh, rapidly, uh, produces, uh, reproduces through seed and uh, is, is a problem because it displaces uh, native plants that are, are more kind of in balance with the, with the in natural environment. And uh, it's reported as escaped in Jackson County, Williamson, Johnson, uh, and a few other Southern Illinois counties. So uh, that is the uh, Polonia. Um, if you see one, maybe take a, take a souvenir, but I, I wouldn't try to uh, propagate it unfortunately. Uh, Aaron, do you have any, any other details or info on this one? I would just say if, um, if you look it up on the internet and um, you find some of the websites where it's being sold, it's marketed as the fastest growing tree in the world. So that makes me question it because um, it has very, very quick growth rates, um, which already makes me suspicious that it could become invasive. So um, yeah, it's funny because Austin will often talk about all of the beautiful qualities of a plant. And then I look at it and I'm like, I'm suspicious. That looks like it would be invasive. <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, um, we don't want to necessarily be planting any more of these. It just kind of wandered out of its natural range. So in its natural environment, it's, it's probably a beautiful and valuable plant, but it's in the, the wrong, uh, wrong region, I guess. Um, but yeah, even invasives, you know, I do have some redeeming qualities, but those kind of outweigh the, the harmful uh, long-term consequences of, of plants getting, getting out of their natural range. And that's one of them. So, okay, we'll go ahead and move on here. Um, we did have a, okay. it's kind of maybe a comment. Um, they said they have seen one with purple bloom. So does, and maybe in this picture, maybe it is a little purple. It kind of looks a little white. Um, are, do they have different bloom colors or is it just the picture? Um, I think it maybe is the picture. It's in full light there, but if you kind of look in the back there, there you can kind of see that they're a bit more lavender. But yeah, yeah I think that they're kind of purple to, the light lavender kind of that's that's the common color that you're gonna see okay um, and I, I had a question this tree as it starts to grow does it have very large leaves like leaves that you would be like oh wow those are very big <laughs> have you seen a young one uh, from I, have, from I haven't I don't know Austin oh, okay I'll just have to look it up I think there's one down my road <laughs> I know they are um, I believe they have I believe they have world leaves. I'd have to double check. Okay. I know the leaves look sim similar to a catalpa um, because we okay. had been um, doing tree IDs and in the same location a couple times and we, from a distance, like that's a catalpa. And then we got closer and we saw, um, I don't remember what characteristic of the plant and we went, nope, definitely not. That's a princess tree. <laughs> we okay. were wrong. So, 
that yeah, must be I what it is because I thought it was but... a catalpa at first when I got closer and then there's just something about it that I was like that's not what that is I didn't know yeah. what it was but I just knew it wasn't that so that that must be what it is okay all right um and I don't have any more questions <laughs> okay we'll move on here and this was from St. Clair County, I believe. And this is, we ID this as Bluebell. Uh, scientific name for the genus is uh, Hy Hyacinthoides. And the species would be a, a non, non uh, basically there's a lot of different uh, species of this so uh, that fall into the Bluebell category. And um, some other common names are uh, English bluebell or common bluebell, or I guess uh, hyacinthoides maybe, and um, it's a, a, a grows out of a bulb, so it's a perennial bulb type plant from Europe, and uh, it's a spring blooming uh, ornamental plant, not not invasive or anything, but not a native. That's you know just the categorization. And the flowers emerge uh, in May. And it kind of has a yellowish white or cream anthers as part of the flower structure. And uh, they're pleasant and uh, usually strongly scented, as are the leaves. So I'm not too familiar with the scent of uh, Bluebell. I guess it has a distinct scent, though. But um, other than that, I don't have a ton of other information for this one. It's a uh, uh, full sun to part shade and uh, low maintenance, kind of uh, nice, uh, nice for some nice purple color in the, in, the, in the landscape or as a massing in the garden. So maybe this is something that we could mix in with some, uh, li uh, some uh, lilies or, or uh, iris or something like that. It might complement those kind of uh, flowers. And uh, it, I, I think it would even work with uh, hostas and um, other kind of kind of broadleaf uh, perennial uh, flowering things like that, herbaceous kind of things. Okay, do we have any questions on bluebell? Uh, no questions. All right. I believe I think the next few are some some uh, plants for Aaron. These are some kind of native. <clears throat> woodland kind of plants. Yeah, so this one um, that we have here is a species of pussy toes. So it's a plantain leaved pussy toes. And it's named to that because these tiny um, little white clusters of flowers, if you kind of hold it upside down, it looks like cat feet. Um, it's just a cute little plant. It grows about six inches tall, um, but it really looks interesting as a ground cover as well. So I'm not sure how well it does um, in a cultivated setting if you put it in your garden, um, but it produces these um, basil rosettes of leaves that kind of form um, a carpet. And some species like this one here, it has um, kind of a white underside on the leaves, um, but some of them are silvery on top as well. So they're very, um, just aesthetically pleasing. I think they're a really cute plant. Um, so it's one that I hope to one day introduce into my garden, but um, really cool plant. You can find them out in the um, woods when the spring ephemerals are blooming and a little bit later in the season as well. That's what I got for this one. Okay, uh, there are no questions. I have one quick question and what's this flower back here? Uh, that looks like a spring beauty. Okay. From the side, yeah. That's what okay. I would say. <laughs> yeah, I just noticed that there. In the background, yeah. Spring beauty. All right, we'll move on. I believe the next one is yours as well. Okay, yes. This is one of my absolute favorites um, that you can find out um, blooming one of our spring ephemerals. This is Celandine poppy and produces this very large golden yellow flower. And one of my favorite parts about this plant is actually the buds. So you can see all of those white um, sections below the flower. Sorry, words are not 
with me right now. Um, but the buds look like they're covered in these bristly white hairs um, and they just look very striking to me. And then you can see all the foliage um, around them as well. Just really interesting um, lobed leaves and they'll continue to persist after the flowers have faded. Um, so just a really, really pretty um, plant. I know several people who have included it in their home gardens in a shadier spot um, and it does really well. So another one that's on my list to one day add to my garden. Okay, um, I don't have any questions for that one. Okay, and I believe I have seen this in a few yards and a few in a few front yards in my neighborhood. So let's see what's awesome. next. Spread it everywhere. <laughs> I will try to see if I, they'll give me some seed or something. Okay, this yeah. is woodland phlox, and this is a woodland kind of plant, but it's also uh, one that is used in kind of more native landscaping. It's one that I use in my native landscaping presentations as an example. And uh, the scientific name is phlox uh, divaricati, and that's, that'll do for pronunciation. And um, so this is a herbaceous perennial. In, in the phlox family and it can be found growing in uh, kind of understories of woodland kind of uh, environments and dappled shade and in open woods or partially shaded meadows and along stream banks. And phlox spreads in slow moving clumps or patches so it, it kind of can, can be used as a ground cover to an extent. And uh, blooms from late spring to early summer and it's a native in Illinois. And that's what I have for this one. If, if you have anything to add, Aaron, if not, we'll take any questions. Uh, no questions. I would just like to add that I love seeing flocks in the springtime. It's like one that I just immediately see in people's landscaping when they have it like mm -hmm. as a first flower. So yep. very pretty, but uh, no questions. Okay. I would just yeah. add that typically it's a little bit darker purple too, so yeah. I don't know if it's just that picture, um, but there can be some light lavender um, plants that pop up every now and then too, so. I see it a lot in uh, the um, Chautauqua Bottoms Nature Trail, uh, which is just down this well, couple blocks away, and uh, yeah, it's a really pretty plant mixed in there in the spring and I, I feel like the ones that are in Chautauqua Bottoms are blue. I think they're darker blue. Yeah so. there's some of them are more bluish darkish purple so they got they vary in their color. Yep that is that's one of my favorite uh, spring ephemerals. I, well I don't know is that a spring ephemeral is it more of just a, a, a spring summer wildflower? Well it's one of my favorite wildflowers. We'll way. go with that. <laughs> and so this next one is uh, one for you. And I think uh, the next one after that is for you, Erin. Okay, yes. Um, so we have um, Christmas fern here. And uh, I don't want you to be intimidated by a fern. This is the easiest fern, in my opinion, to identify. Um, and it stays evergreen all year round. So that's one really helpful um, hint for you. And it has very leathery like leaves that you can't necessarily tell. You can see some shininess on the leaves in this picture. And uh, I'm trying to look and see and I don't know, Austin, if you can kind of point with your um, cursor, if you can point out kind of the asymmetrical leaf base, um, maybe we can find one. But it kind of looks like the leaf is boot shaped. Um, and there's like a little um, projection on one side of the leaf base where it joins that central stem. And that's the easiest characteristic to look for to identify it as Christmas fern. Um, so very easy to tell when you're um, in person and can see it, but uh, this is another one that's recommended for a shady spot in your, um, in your garden. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have to say about this one, but you can hopefully after this talk say you can identify at least one fern, which is kind of where I'm at. So <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Christmas fern. What I'm pointing here is this what we would call, it, so this with a fern, this, this 
one compound leaf, right? This whole yes, kind technically, of yes, they're leaflets, yeah. And so what we're talking about, the identification is where it joins kind of right here, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, if you um, kind of up a couple leaflets, like the one above your cursor, right there, there's like a little triangular tip yeah. um, that's kind of like, it looks like the toe of a, of a boot. Yeah. Um, again, more apparent if it's, you know, if you're right in front of it and <laughs> it's closer, but I encourage you to, to try and find that characteristic on a fern next time you're, you're out and see one. I'll be looking out for that. That's going to be one that will be on the radar. Awesome. This is another one for Aaron. We have one oh, We did have a fern question. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> um, no, it was just talking about, um, I believe the best time to transplant one of those. Ooh, Austin, do you know? I don't know. Uh, you know, transplanting for most things is going to be best done in spring. Those are the general, generally the best times, you know, because if we're doing it in, in spring, the plant has enough time to adjust and acclimate before it gets very hot. So, uh, it, it, and in fall, kind of the, the idea with transplanting is that, uh, it gives the plant time to acclimate again to to harden off for winter and develop uh, some uh, some root structure that will help it uh, uh, come out of dormancy quicker and be a little bit more acclimated in spring. Um, whereas if we're transplanting something in summer, that's going to be uh, the highest chance for it to get shocked from uh, water loss, water stress, and, and heat stress. Now with ferns, I don't have a ton of experience personally with transplanting ferns. Um, so if uh, if you wanted to uh, email me, I could I could find more info for you. Okay, and uh, that we don't have any more questions about that. Okay. Okay, and I think this is one for Erin. Okay. Um, so we have a couple different plants in this picture. The one that's in the foreground um, that's a little out of focus is um, one of our trilliums. So that's a trillium. Um, I think the common name is prairie trillium off the top of my head. Um, but trillium recurvatum is the common, is the Latin name, excuse me. <laughs> um, and um, pretty distinct because it has those um, red petals that you can see, those three red petals. Um, Typically it has mottled dark green leaves, but they can be more solid as well. And it's gonna, um, the leaves are gonna have a petiole um, as well. I have, fun fact, one time I've seen a trillium that had four leaves. So he was a little confused. It's like finding a four leaf clover. <laughs> um, so that was fun to find. Um, and then all the plants in the background of that picture are may apples. Um, and then if we want to keep going, the ones on the bottom um, looks like Virginia creeper. So common poison ivy look alike, um, but that one has more than three leaflets. So um, Virginia creeper has five. And the Virginia creeper is not toxic. And I've heard, I've heard it be uh, misidentified as, um, as another kind of poisonous weed um but it's uh, this is not this this is not toxic although it's a pretty aggressive vining kind of spreading thing that likes to grow up houses and can mm -hmm. be a new you know. it is a host plant for the virginia creeper sphinx moth though so if you want some sphinx moths cool. you might find those caterpillars on that plant so so it's got to throw in more pollinator stuff whenever I can. <laughs> it's, it's got a it's got a job. It's got a it, it serves a purpose. Yes, it does. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, no questions. Okay, so this is our last plant for today, and was Aaron was this one that you wanted to talk about? I can talk about it. You can start, and I'll add. Okay. That works for me. <laughs> This is, uh, this is butterweed, and I believe it's in the mustard family. Correct me if I'm wrong. Nope. <laughs> this no. one's an aster. Oh, okay. There we go. Yep. It looks like, it looks kind of like yellow rocket, which is a mustard. 
Okay. So easy to get confused. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. And so the other common name is crest leaf ground sorrel and uh, butterweed is a winter annual. So it seeds germinate in late summer to early fall. And um, Aaron, is this a biennial? Is that right? Does it, does I it... have seen that it is listed as an annual or a biennial. Okay. So I think it depends on your location, how it behaves. So. Right. It's going to depend on, yeah, how, how warm it gets. So if it's a biennial, it's going to be uh, growing its uh, foliage and then storing energy over winter. And then in the spring, it's going to have these uh, nice vibrant yellow flowers. And so uh, what else about this one? Um, it's very common in agricultural fields. So uh, I, I, th I think even still now, if, if we see a field that's got a lot of yellow flowers in it, a lot of that's going to be butterweed. One other interesting thing about butterweed is the, the flowers, seeds, stems, and leaves, so the whole plant, uh, above ground plant, uh, contains a alkaloid that can cause liver damage to livestock. And the resulting disease is called uh, senesiosis. So that is something that uh, is typically managed and, and uh, tried to be controlled in uh, forage type uh, systems. And so that is, that's what I have for yellow, or not yellow rocket, butterweed. And Aaron, do you have any other, any other info for this one? Um, just, I believe it is a native plant, but it is weedy. Mm -hmm. um, typically likes a lot of lower water areas. Um, and it does have a hollow central stem. So if you are not quite sure and you wanna just cut the stem and see if it's hollow, that's another clue um, that can help you ID this one. But yeah, that's what I got. Interesting. I didn't know that it was a native. I think, well, you know what? As we're talking, I'm just going to double check. Okay. <laughs> um, I did have a question while you're looking. Um, and this person was actually asking about yellow rocket since it was mentioned. Um, is that an invasive plant, um, yellow rocket? It's not invasive. Um, I'm not sure if it's native or non-native. Native, excuse me. I can look that up really fast, too. Um, Let's see, so the butterweed, what was the, let's see, let's see. I, th I believe it's native. My key's not telling me it's non-native. Um, and then yellow rockets, let me double check real fast. I think I've heard that the butterweed is native. That sounds familiar. I don't know about yellow rocket. Um, but. Yellow rocket's native to Eurasia. That's what I thought. So it's not native. Um, you know, kind of depends on if it's acting aggressively and then you can treat it, you know, as invasive. Um, it's not really on any watch lists or anything like that, but um, Kind of when it comes to non-native plants, if they're causing a problem, then go ahead and treat it and take care of it. Um, but yeah, so the, they're non, yellow rocket is non-native. Yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think I've heard it, people talk about it um, in like an agricultural field, like being a nuisance. Like, right, but not yes. I've heard it maybe like one time someone talk about it, you know? Um, I think it falls into the category of um, DYFs. And those are uh, dang wildflowers or dang yellow flowers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> dang yellow flowers. So it's one of those. Uh, so it's a, a nuisance, but maybe not um, quite invasive. Okay. I think that wraps it up. There was a submission that we didn't include because we could not figure it out. And that person we're going to uh, message separately. Once we maybe get an idea, I'm gonna try to consult other educators to try to figure out what it is. It was a viney kind of plant. So sorry, it's not on here. We just couldn't come up with a reasonable identification. So we'll get back to you on that one. 
But here is our contact information for myself and Aaron. And as I said, if any of these things, if you'd like to follow up with me, I can try to get you uh, more or better info. And uh, we'll take any questions about what we've covered, if there are any. And I'll just mention really quick also that um, if you ever do have, you know, a plant question, we are always happy to um, try to ID a plant for you. You know, usually that's dropping it off at the office, but if you're able to take a few um, pictures that are in focus um, of some key plant parts that can really help us out. Um, so usually, you know, if you want to send in a picture of the whole plant, that can be helpful, but then a few like targeted close-up pictures. So of course, if there are flowers, a picture of the flower can help, um, but always including pictures of the leaves and um, pictures of where that leaf joins the stem also can be really helpful for helping us identify. But we're always happy um, to try to figure out what you're looking at and try to answer any questions that you have on, on any of those plants. All right. Thank you guys so much for doing that. Um, I was actually going to say that, Erin, about the pictures. Oh, you got it. <laughs> um, and thank you guys for taking the time. It is sometimes very difficult to ID a plant through a picture.